Okay, cool. Yeah, so why don't we kick off? Can you hear me okay, Nardo? Yeah, loud and clear. Great. Well, hey, Nardo, thanks for making time for me. There'll probably be people popping in slowly, but, um, you know, it's been great to get to know you the last couple months and, and uh, you know, really understand the sector focus that you're going after. It's a massive market size opportunity. So really excited about your investment thesis and um, your, your background and also just your interest um, to, to really grow uh, the market size for this space by investing in it. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, where you're from, and um, a little bit about your career and education, and then how you got into starting your own fund, focusing on quantum computing. Okay, yeah, sure. Thanks, Joel. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, so background-wise, uh, I grew up uh, uh, in the Philippines, actually born in the Philippines, but mm -hmm. um, lived in many different countries. So lived in Vietnam, uh, lived in Papua New Guinea, uh, lived mm -hmm. in Australia, lived here in the U.S. So uh, traveled quite a bit. Uh, yeah. And uh, education-wise, I'm a uh, computer science uh, graduate. Uh, 25 plus years in the healthcare deep tech space, uh, former yeah. head of innovation uh, for uh, Kaiser Permanente, mm -hmm. and uh, you know along the along that line, you know I love my work at Kaiser so much that I created my own uh, healthcare innovation ecosystem, uh, a company mm -hmm. called Catalyze first, and the whole premise of Catalyze is really to work with investors, uh, technology companies, and corporations to bring them together for uh, some level of uh, you know uh, transactions for their all uh, for their success. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, since I dealt so much with, uh, you know, technology, technological innovation, you know, part of what I do is I did a lot of AI work, did a lot of six AI products. And so my natural curiosity in emerging technology uh, extended to quantum. So three years ago, I started looking into the quantum space, studying that and basically said, OK, well, you know, I need to look at all the different signals within the industry, the quantum industry, and then uh, this year and last year, all the signals I was looking for uh, basically came to fruition. And I said, OK, it's time to start that fund. So I started the Qubits Ventures. And what was your thought process when you decided to start the fund? So you're working in uh, corporate, you know, and, you know, what, you know, what was going on in your head? What, what was the trigger that made you realize that you should go ahead and start the fund? Yeah, I think the uh, one thing is, uh, one is definitely the uh, AI, right? A AI was a, a big proponent of uh, yeah, a big part of the decision. And then the amount of data that we have uh, in that that's being accumulated uh, within the healthcare setting, not just healthcare, I guess, across industry. Mm -hmm. And then if you take a look at the, the world we have right now, everything is getting way complex. <laughs> the yeah. problems are more complex. We have a lot more data. We have a lot more systems. Um, they're all cloud versus internal. It's just very complex. And the only way we could uh, get ahead of that is, you know, you have to look at the, a more exponential technology uh, called quantum mm -hmm. technologies. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about um, the quantum ecosystem. So I think maybe for the audience, what would be really helpful, and you've gone through this with me before, but just unpacking the whole ecosystem of quantum and where you think it's heading. So what are the different, uh, you know, verticals that are great applications right now for quantum? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question, Joel. So let, let's take a look at quantum. So a lot of people equate quantum technologies to just quantum computing, mm -hmm. which is actually, you know, whenever I uh, whenever I talk to people, I said, okay, quantum, uh, you're into quantum technology. Uh, quantum technologies. The first thing they ask is like, oh, when is, when is quantum technology going to be real, right? Yeah. So. Uh, so, but exactly, you know, that question really meant when is quantum computing going to be real? Uh, quantum technologies is a much broader subject, right? So there are uh, many different areas in quantum technologies that are, I consider, more shorter term as opposed to longer term, which quantum computing uh, could be. Uh, so the areas and the core investment thesis that I have, at least for my fund, are what I consider low hanging fruit, right? So one would be quantum applications that are in the uh, optimization space, uh, cryptography, uh, AI and machine learning, the uh, applications related to that. 
uh, and then in the area of uh, uh, simulation. So things like protein folding, molecular designs and stuff like that for drug discovery. Uh, and then the, uh, the other category is when you have hardware, quantum hardware, you also need the software aspect, right? So uh, quantum software, system software, things like operating systems, uh, programming editors, uh, programming platforms, data platforms, data and analytics platform for quantum computing. Uh, the other area is uh, what we call um, devices. So things like uh, components of devices, right? So uh, quantum sensors, uh, that's actually more of a near-term uh, technology that uh, you know, will have uh, immediate impact. So things like a quantum sensor for, uh, for cell vibration inside of a body, right? So that, that, that is already happening. Uh, quantum sensors for medical imaging, to improve medical images, that's uh, that's already happening. Uh, and then what we from a from a technical standpoint, when you when you think about quantum sensors, um, what are they doing that is different than a typical sensor? Because you know, fundamental concepts of quantum is being able to calculate everything pretty much at the same time um, mm -hmm. or in real time. Versus you know the classical computing, you have zeros and ones, right? So you mm -hmm. kind of got to run that run those models. And it's uh, much more of a tedious process with classical computing versus quantum. So, how uh, from you know what are the sensors doing to to be you know is it more accuracy? Is it more velocity of the calculations? Are they using models to predict um, you know how accurate the the touch points could be? Yeah, it, it comes in many different uh, things, right? So, for, for example, uh, in, in, in the case of quantum, quantum, you know, human beings are actually quantum beings, right? So uh, the, the, with quantum, uh, the, the whole thing with quantum is, you know, the, the whole definition of quantum is really, uh, it, it's, it's, it's about an energy source, right? At the smallest minute particle, right? So uh, if you decompose that, you, you're looking at atoms, Photons, electrons. So, the those these kind of elements are actually uh, could be used as sensors. So, if you look, if you have, uh, let's say, a uh, an electron or an atom as a sensor, then basically that that kind of a small size of a sensor can go inside your body, and you can measure what yeah. that atom is is getting into, right? So that's one example. Another example is. Uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, a GPS, right? So right now, what we, when we have a GPS, uh, we're looking at, you know, uh, triangulating, you know, positions by X, Y, and Z, right? So uh, using satellite technologies with the, with the quantum sensors, it's looking at uh, the magnet, the, 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 um, uh, the, the what, what I call the magnetism within the earth itself to actually locate your position <laughs> within. So you can have an offline GPS type of a, a sensor as well. So those are the kind of um, uh, areas that are uh, being built. Uh, another area is, you know, in the device space, it's called quantum photonics, the use of light to basically uh, create devices, right? So uh, I know of a startup that's using uh, quantum photonics to just do data transfer. So there, but the, because it's quantum and it's uh, light sources, uh, it is a thousand percent, a, a thousand times better than the current technology. So if you look at that, it's like, gosh, you know, that's that, that's the kind of exponential level of technology we need. Because uh, think about, you know, a use case for uh, medical imaging. If you're transferring a large, uh, you know, a CAT scan over, you know, the internet. I'm sure you could use a, some some level of uh, assistance in, in assistance in that kind of a device. Yeah, and how did you? You know, obviously, there's a lot of people that, you know, because your role at the at Kaiser Permanente it wasn't an investing role, right? It was more of a was it more of like a research and development uh, it, role. It, it's actually both. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's an investing from a, a technology innovation perspective. So Got we it. provided kind of like corporate VC a little bit. Uh, more on the uh, uh, pilots, right? And then if mm -hmm. everything goes well on the pilot side of things, then basically what happens is it gets promoted up into uh, a larger scale and then corporate ventures get involved because they want to make sure that the company survives. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I'm wondering, you know, there's a lot of people like this that just jump into either venture from 
um, you know, joining a firm or they just start their own fund. So what did you do to develop that skill set to start the firm? Was it a lot of self-training? And I think the good thing now is there's so many communities for emerging managers. There's so many blogs and people that you can follow on Twitter. But, you know, there, and I'm asking because there's a few people in here that are interested in starting their own fund. So what, what advice would you give when you kind of said, hey, you know what, I, I, I had some good experience, been working at large corporates uh, for some time. Um, I think I'm just going to go off and start my own fund. So what, what would be the first few things that you would recommend these people to maybe read or, or think about or, or um, research uh, before they start a fund? Yeah, I, I think uh, you, you need to make sure that, you know, in terms of what you're doing, you, you, you know, you can do an inventory of what you've done and what mm-hmm. you're currently doing and, and to see, you know, how much of that aligns towards, uh, you know, becoming a BC, right? Because if you don't even know what you know and what you have, uh, it, it's hard for you to kind of target where you need to go, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I've done quite a bit of work in, um, I ran a virtual accelerator. I've accelerated 36 companies, uh, two unicorns coming out of that. Uh, I've, cre- I've exited two startups uh, in the past as well. So I, I did an inventory uh, of, of everything that I've done and haven't done, right? So the biggest the biggest thing that I haven't done is really, okay, you know, I didn't, um, uh, I didn't really do uh, investing, uh, seed investments, right? Uh, I didn't really do, uh, I didn't know the, the financial landscape of what happens within a VC firm, but I've supported investors from a due diligence perspective. So I, yeah. that became part of my competency. And then after that, mm-hmm. I said, okay, well, you know, who can give me this kind of training? Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, and, and then basically I got referred to uh, VC labs. Mm-hmm. And that's where yeah. I got to be trained. Sure. And then what are some ways that uh, people who are not in venture could build those skills? You know, if they don't get accepted into a program or, or they don't, um, you know, develop those skills organically, uh, would you recommend them to possibly just try to actively source deals, possibly join an accelerator, start a company? I guess, what are, what are some of the pathways that you've seen, you know, because you went through couple of these accelerator programs. So what, what were like the journeys of some of the other fund managers that started out? Yeah, I think uh, the, the journey definitely varied, right? So mm-hmm. one is you, you need to, um, you, you need to take a look at uh, maybe advising startup mm-hmm. companies, right? So yeah. build your advisory uh, capability there because it's going to help you create value add as a fund, right? So, so building that second is, uh, uh, see if you can become uh, um, a seed investor, right? So, mm-hmm. or an angel investor, I mean. Yeah. So you can do some small uh, angel investment, direct investment in companies. Uh, that would be great, right? Uh, mm-hmm. The other is, uh, in order for you to build your track record, uh, a good way to do it is to partner with somebody who does SPVs. Right. Yeah. So uh, that, that would be a good way. Um, it's, so you could learn the ropes. And while you're learning the ropes, uh, you're actually, you know, you're you're actually, be, you know, acting like a VC because you're looking for LPs. Uh, yeah. You're um, you're sending out emails. You're going through the entire process of, you know, what typically a VC does, except for one one particular startup right, or a company. Uh, you build your track record that way, create your markups, and then you know, and then you you step into okay, maybe it's time for me to do uh, uh, to do a full blown VC firm. Sure, and we spoke about this too. So quantum could be quite unique as far as sourcing deals. So you know, not only limited to quantum, but just very complex deep tech. How do you recommend people to source great opportunities? Um, is it academia? Is it other? tier one funds, all of the above, I guess, what's been working for you and what would you advise people to do if they're trying to uh, focus on a lot of these complex deep tech opportunities? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's definitely to, to definitely be out there, right? So mm-hmm. one is, uh, the, one, one of the big things that I did for my fund is, uh, you know, uh, quantum is such a very, uh, such a complex space. Uh, I needed to make sure that I created my own community, right? So mm-hmm. one is, uh, part of my fund, I have 21 quantum scientists and engineers uh, that's mm-hmm. helping me with due diligence. But they are also acting like scouts, right? So they're when they when they hear about a startup, they tell me about it. Uh, yeah. 
The other area is uh, I've also created uh, what we call acceleration partners. So I partnered with major uh, academia companies and you know service providers, uh, quantum foundries that can create prototypes. And all of these are basically good sources for startups because these startups are looking for these kind of services. So besides just the typical accelerator, you know, incubator, venture studio, uh, research organization, academia, you, you, a lot of people will basically source that way, right? But I think that the best, for, for me, the, the, biggest, uh, uh, the, the biggest and better source is not necessarily, you know, just looking at the list coming from, you know, an accelerator in, the, in their list of cohort. Uh, if it's recommended to you, then you know that there's a good potential for that. Sure. And when you're sourcing and screening deals, what are some things that you look for? What's your process? Uh, and again, just thinking through how to um, educate the people in the room as far as, you know, just new emerging fund managers, what are some of the criteria that you look for? And, and I think it'd be really inter interesting to understand, obviously, the difference with with uh, quantum. I'm assuming most of these are like a typical deep tech startup where there's no revenue, right? So it's probably just more based on the science and the and the market size and the tech is that accurate or if not feel free to correct me if i'm wrong uh, for, for the most part it's accurate uh, especially mm -hmm. in this space but there are some key areas uh, especially in the low hanging fruit for example in quantum photonics uh, yeah. where things are uh, uh, there seems to be a lot more uh, quantum companies in that space that is closer mm -hmm. to a production level type scenario so i've seen those kind of things so you know the typical criteria I, I, I use is definitely the uh, definitely the team aspect mm -hmm. of it is very important, uh, but I also look at the IP right because the the IP and the people behind the IP, mm -hmm. uh, and also the in terms of if it's academia, uh, how much exclusive rights do they have right? So because um, one thing that you don't want to have happen is you know you you you, you spin off there's a spin off company that doesn't have exclusive rights on the IP and then it gets copied and then basically that startup yeah. gets killed right so I do look at the exclusivity of the IP and the people coming out of academia as well uh, and then the the other part to it is you know I I also wanted to see what makes them what makes them unique and differentiated uh, compared to the other, uh, uh, you know, even though it's a nascent area, uh, there's competitors as well. A, a good example is in the quantum computing space, right? So there are quantum computers that are like superconducting, uh, you, you know, uh, qubits type quantum computer. There are trapped ion, ions uh, using cryogenics and stuff like that. Uh, then comes along, here's a quantum computer that is room temperature that's using quantum photonics. So who would you rather bet on? The, the one that does the, uh, requires a big refrigerator to basically run that, that computer or do you want the one that doesn't require the refrigerator? And what's next after quantum? Is there another evolution after well, quantum or I guess, where do you think things are going to go? Is it going to be some type of cell-based computer or atom-based computer? I guess where, you know, well, where are we, we heading next? Well, quantum, it, it's atom-based computing already, yeah. right? So, sure. so it's atom, protons, neutrons, uh, electrons, and anything of that uh, of that uh, of that sort. And so, what's going to happen is I can see, uh, I can see there, there's also an emerging area called quantum biology. Oh, well, how does Sean cool? There's also an emerging area called quantum biology. So yeah. now, think of that. It's like, okay, well, what can you do with that? So, mm -hmm. so think of like. Uh, uh, you having a, an embedded quantum chip that basically, you know, either enhances you and uh, and does things, uh, you know, for you. Uh, think of uh, 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 the the nirvana of an AI system because it's mm -hmm. using quantum exponential technology, right? So, so think of like a, a, a AGI, artificial general intelligence, because it, that could be a possibility uh, because quantum technology, you know, when it comes to real fruition, uh, uh, is definitely a possibility. So two things, you know, how do you think it's going to impact or complement Neuralink? And then number two is crypto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, quantum, from, so crypto from a perspective of uh, definitely security uh, would, would be a good one uh, because mm -hmm. quant, 
it, it quantum uh, the big one of the biggest benefit with quantum is in what we call random number generation. So our existing our existing classical computer actually doesn't generate random numbers. That's why mm -hmm. it, we could easily hack computers, right? Yeah. So with with the, with the quantum uh, crypt cryptography here, you know, and when we're looking at quantum factorization, um, th then basically this uh, this technology creates truly random numbers, truly random random numbers. So it's it's really hard to crack, or it's mm -hmm. almost close to impossible to crack. So we we have to see. You know when things happen, like quantum to quantum type uh, type scenario. Uh, let's see. Let's see what happens there. Sure. Um, so Farouk, you had a question. You want to rattle off your question? Uh, sure. I think uh, thanks, Nardo. Uh, so I was wondering about how these continued leaps in quantum computing will affect uh, crypto cryptography because you know the the secured hashes. Uh, they stock for you know banking being in jeopardy because of you know the leaps in quantum computing and you know everything needs to be redone. Like what? How do you see that landscape? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that that's a big area of interest of mine. You know, one of my earlier uh, portfolio companies is in the post quantum cybersecurity space, uh, for, right? So so uh, one is you know it, it's just a matter of time that quantum quantum technology can actually break existing RSA technology. Uh, so I think we have to kind of watch out for that. So there's also this concept of uh, uh, steal now, decrypt later, right? So a, a lot. So so that concept is more of like they're stealing our data. They can't decrypt it right now. But once they have uh, quantum um, quantum uh, cryptography and you know encryption decryption technology, they could actually crack that easily, right? Sure. So the other is, you know, uh, you have to protect the entire system. It's not just about Okay, protecting you know the, the data at rest and all of that stuff. You have to also protect. Uh, you also have to protect the you know the the, the networks. You have to protect the, the communications and and the devices and all of that. Uh, similar to what we're doing with existing technology now, you know, with cybersecurity technology. But what what needs to happen is you know especially in crypto, the entire crypto system needs to also become quantum quantum resistant, uh, quantum protected. So just to follow up, so are you investing or looking into startups uh, in that uh, post quantum cybersecurity space yeah. as well? Yeah, I am. Okay, I am. thanks, uh, Michael. You've got a question here. Thank you, Narda, for you know, speaking with us. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor. Um, you've done a lot. Um, I just wanted to ask, what are some of the projects people are doing at Kaiser uh, involving AI and healthcare? And if they're using patient or de-identified patient data, how are they able to secure it? So it's maybe not uh, attacked by ransomware or it's not able to get out. So that's somewhat challenging. Yeah, it's it, it is definitely challenging. So it's definitely not just a Kaiser issue, right? So the entire healthcare industry, if you took a look at the, uh, uh, there's a recent report related to uh, uh, by industry in terms of data breaches. Healthcare is number one. <laughs> so that is the number one spot you don't want to be in, right? So healthcare is definitely number one in data breaches, uh, which includes ransomware. So, you know, uh, the healthcare organization, what they tend to do, you know, with these, uh, a lot of the healthcare organization, when, they, when it comes to AI, a lot of them are doing things like uh, predictive analytics, population care, and, and things like that, right? Uh, so that's primarily a lot of the stuff that they do. They're also doing things like uh, process automation with the aid of AI uh, and RPA type system. There's a lot of that stuff happening as well. Um, so in terms of how they secure it, uh, the, the typical, uh, the typical uh, encryption methodology that we have now. So at the very least, an AES 256-bit encryption, uh, but they can go up all the way up to FIPS, right? So the FIPS, which is the government standard, FIPS 140, 140, uh, 140 and, and stuff like that. But um, uh, from a government standpoint uh, in NIST, uh, they're already looking at all the different post-quantum uh, cryptography type algorithms actually. So they're starting to get into what standards uh, in the industry can actually adopt. And one thing that they found is they're interested more in post-quantum cryptography and th that 
kind of uh, category of solution compared to what we call uh, quantum key distribution, uh, that space of it. So there are two areas in, and there are two approaches in terms of how you do security. One is QKD and the other is post-quantum. Uh, so the post-quantum one seems to be winning out. Thank you. Yeah. And I just have another question if that's okay. Um, I'm actually also in healthcare um, and I know trying to go through some of the unstructured data uh, can be challenging. And I wanted to ask if anyone is uh, using natural language processing to try to build models for, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite popular. So uh, healthcare is one is an early adopter actually of NLP, right? Because of the whole di uh, di uh, dictation process. So doctor dictation, that's all M M NLP based uh, ever since in the very beginning. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of work, right? So things like uh, nuance, right? So where they, where they do uh, ambience listening in terms of patient provider conversation and, you know, based on that, uh, they could do uh, auto documentation. They could do, uh, you know, auto scribing. Uh, you know, to, those are some of the key pain points. Uh, NLP to look into unstructured notes to codify them to see if they if there if it has any correlation towards care and 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 uh, uh, care and and stuff like that. Um, so there's definitely a lot of work on the NLP side. Uh, I, some of the products I built for AI and healthcare, uh, I have built uh, three virtual avatars. Think of them as like virtual nurses and doctors, right? So uh, one is related to Parkinson's disease, where you know it's an uh, it's an avatar that can uh, do a Q and A on you, that can do a daily assessment on you, can record your voice, right? And can record your voice and listen to your voice, and whenever it listens. The AI listens to the voice. It listens for some voice biomarkers and kind of determine, okay, is the is the tonality, the sound, or the cadence of that voice, or uh, is is the speech changing in itself? And then from there, you could uh, figure out a score uh, related to you know whether the Parkinson's disease is getting better or actually getting worse. That's phenomenal! Wow, thank you. Yeah, that's great technology. Thanks. Switching, switching gears on the tactical side of investing, um, you talked about the team earlier. What are some patterns that you've seen with teams that have gotten you excited and have uh, given you some insights into them being an investable company? Are there some common patterns? Is it, you know, with quantum, is it more the, the, the scientific background? Is it, you know, you know, and then one thing I'm seeing now is a lot of these deep tech companies, they're starting to have B2B SaaS type of revenue multiples, which is really exciting to see. That means that some of these products that are pre-revenue that are more research and development for like three years until they raise tons of money, they're thinking to monetize much quicker and come up with components or products that they can sell um, and go out and and generate revenue to possibly you know justify these massive valuations. So, can you go deeper on what you look for in a team and what's what excites you as you're sourcing and screening? Yeah, definitely because this is a very complicated. Uh, the the science is so complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's unbelievably complicated. I thought AI was complicated. Uh, it, it compares nothing to it, right? So, uh, one is definitely you know the the. In this space, if you have a, if you have a, um, uh, you can expect at the very least a PhD, right? It's a PhD mm -hmm. level. So, you know, typically the kind of teams I see are like a, a good founding team, you know, let's say of three to five people, all of them will have a PhD. <laughs> so uh, if you have a single PhD, you're good, but you know, there, some of them even have the dual PhDs. So, so that's the level of complexity. So that, that's one. Uh, the other pattern I saw are definitely if they are um, uh, professors inside of academia that mm -hmm. is coming out, uh, that's definitely a big plus because they, they've been around for a while and they also have access and potentially have exclusive rights to, to the IP because they have a lab in the university, right? So, and they could use a lot of university resources to basically, uh, 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 continue a lot of their R&D uh, using uh, students. 
So I see quite a bit of that. Uh, the, the pattern that I see with these quantum companies are they're good at the science and the technology, but you know the typical issue with deep tech is you know, how about the business side of things, right? So the business side of things, the operations, the finance, the accounting, and setting up the IT infrastructure, those are the things that they don't, uh, they don't really like, but must do. So part of what I do with my fund is, you know, I, I created a group of fractional executives to basically help them, you know, go through that process so they can concentrate on the things that they uh, that they are really good at and then uh, get some help and get some structure related to the things that they normally wouldn't uh, really feel comfortable until, you know, they, they, they've gotten some guidance. So that's the approach that I took. So, so from a team standpoint, uh, uh, I, I think the other one is like the number of uh, patents that they uh, and publications that they, they write on these because you can see their thought leadership. So if they have a lot of uh, things there, uh, it's great. If they have a lot of uh, potential IP, they have a, a list of you know all the things that they filed, all the things that they want to file. I'm always I'm always looking at that. And then second is and and, and then the other are definitely I'd like to see some level of proof, right? So if somebody says, hey, you know I'm creating this really fantastic technology, it has some level of quantum physics algorithm in there, and it's changing the entire world of energy, for example, right? Then I need to see, okay, well, you know, can you can, let me see your process for validation. Let me see some proof of uh, whether that technology works. And once I've seen some level of uh, technology working, proof of technology, then I know the team in, in itself can really execute from that level. And I just need to surround them from a business perspective. What are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing with quantum companies? I'm assuming it's, I'm assuming it's access to be able to fundraise really quickly, but um, I'm not, you know, I love your insights on that. Yeah. So, so, so this is, a, this is a hot area, right? So, mm -hmm. the, and so a lot of deep tech funds actually want to invest in these areas, but have a hard time investing because they, they can't mm -hmm. do, the, do the due diligence. Right. So yeah. uh, it's hard to do diligence, these companies without the right kind of resources. So that, that's one thing. Uh, I, I think the other is uh, the, the level of valuations they start off with are very high. <laughs> so the, the mm -hmm. stuff that I normally would see, you know, I'm doing pre-seed level, pre-seed level, pre-seed plus, right? Yeah. Uh, the, normally I would see, you know, the kind of valuation at the level that I'm doing, I normally would see it in seed but it's come down to pre -seed. Okay. That's so, a little better than I thought because, you know, when you think about like space companies that are seed mm -hmm. or pre-seed, those are like, those numbers are like series F type of valuations. So and I would have thought it would have been the same thing with quantum. Quantum computers, yes. So mm -hmm. quantum computers, yes. But keep in mind, there are, you know, this is an entire, the, the technology sector includes, you know, if you take, think of like the front, you know, from front end to back end, right? So you have the software pieces, the, the, uh, the system utility pieces, the embedded software pieces, the, the hardware pieces, right? The components pieces. So mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of them and each one of yeah. them uh, could, you know, uh, can actually become its own startup. And those have different valuations as well. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, switching gears to your emerging manager journey, can you share a couple learnings that you've uh, gained in the last, because you've been at this for about a year? Yeah. I'm thinking a couple of years, yeah. So, so what are some uh, big learnings that stand out in the last year, maybe from uh, building the thesis to, to you know, building a pipeline, um, you know, what are some takeaways that we can take back with us? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, one thing, this, the, the VC world, I, I would say is very, uh, it's definitely very relationship driven, right? So mm -hmm. you don't, you don't get better at this unless your relationship is, are really good. So keep, keep that in mind. So um, the biggest thing for me is relationship. Make sure that you're authentic about this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you're authentic. You you, know, you truly care mm -hmm. uh, about what you're doing. And the other is uh, you need to be helpful, right? So to me, you know, the, the, the whole thing about VCs is like uh, you're not the only. If you look at a startup, they they're asking for a lot of money, <laughs> right? Yeah. So the, the whole thing with VCs is like sometimes we get uh, we have a tendency to be competitive. 
I, I think what you want to do is like, don't be competitive. See if you could share, uh, share things and, and, and help out. Uh, I help out a lot. I, you know, what, what is it going to cost me to do an introduction here and there? Uh, I, I, I'm in healthcare. I get a lot of decks for healthcare. Uh, and I yeah. give it. I give it out to the folks. I give out introductions for other VCs because I'm not in. I'm not looking for LPs in healthcare. I, I give out the the kind of introduction. So I think I'm being helpful from that standpoint. Yeah. Sharing deals, uh, relationship, and make sure that you're uh, definitely authentic and you're doing that do, doing this for the right reason, not not because. You know, you want to be, you know, uh, on top of the stage and you know, sharing the limelight there, and uh, and because hey, I'm a VC. That that's not the point. The point is, you know, uh, hopefully you use the vehicle uh, that's given to you to uh, make some uh, impact in humanity and uh, the world. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really good advice. I think that's that's super true. It's super relationship basis. It's a CRM business, so you're, uh, you know, trying to add value to you. You have multiple customers, right? You've got your LPs, you got other VCs that you're co-investing with, you've got uh, founders that you're supporting as well. Um, you know, with the with the technology being so complex, um, I doubt you're going to roll up your sleeves and help these people build the technology. So, what what are some ways that we could add value to these very complex deep tech startups? And and what are you seeing that they need the most help with? Is it product market fit? Is it their deck? Is it fundraising? Is it all of the above? I guess what, you know, with, with the startups that you're working with, what do they need help with and what are they struggling with the most? Yeah, yeah I think that what they normally struggle with is definitely the business mindset, right? Because, they, you know, the majority of these folks are coming from academia, yeah, research institution, and they're good at what they do, right? So, uh, so p- people even ask me and said, Nardo, you know, can you co-found our company with us? Yeah. You do the business aspect of it, and we do the technology aspect of it. I said, uh, I, I'm not sure whether I can do that from a VC yeah. standpoint, uh, but there is a lot of, uh, I, I get a lot of requests like that, mm-hmm. right? So we, you do the business side, we do this piece of it. So I, I think there is, there's definitely an opportunity for something like that. Uh, I don't know what that looks like yet. Uh, is that really an accelerator? Uh, it doesn't seem like so because accelerators are, you know, pretty much like program cohort based and, you know, exp- uh, expires after a certain number of months and so on. They, they want some, some uh, business entity to work with them uh, throughout the, the life of their company. Yeah, what's blown me away a few times is I've seen CEOs of companies who are professors and they want to recruit out the CEO. So that for me is a really red flag because yeah. that just means that look, if you found the company, you should be able to, to run it. And I don't think that's going to be that easy to just farm out to somebody that uh, would come in and just run the company. Obviously that happens right? with a lot of these big companies. People do bring in outside corporate professionals if the company is not working out. But I think in general, as even when you're founding the company, it's and you're doing some tech transfer, you're getting some grant money or you're building it even with some venture money, uh, just trying to delegate out being CEO because you want to be a scientist. Sometimes mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's a huge red flag. I would say yeah. not even sometimes, I'd say all the time. Yeah. And, and that is, you know, caught, definitely causing a, a bit of a difficulty, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, it, it's along the lines because these are, you know, really embedded academics. You know, what do you do? There are professors coming out, for example, right? So they're... Yeah. You know, chief science officer in a large research institution. Uh, so they, that's the key, core area that they're useful in. But the business side of it is uh, definitely uh, an area that needs to get improved. And that's why, you know, the whole fractional executive stuff uh, came mm-hmm. about, is trying to address some of these gaps. Yeah. And w- what do you think the exits will be or what types of exits do you think they will be? For and obviously that's a loaded question, and you yeah. know nobody can predict the future. But you know, do you see them being similar to to space companies, uh, cloud computing companies? Uh, you know, what are what would be the closest comp to quantum computing? Uh, I, I would say they're probably more similar towards more of like the space tech type. You know, they, they, these are large. You know, for example, we have three. Uh, that I could name of uh, right. three quantum computers that basically did uh, exits. Uh, uh, one uh, did a 
uh, an, a cybersecurity company uh, did an exit. Uh, were, they, it's a cybersecurity company worth uh, a couple of billion of dollars. Uh, I think the other is a quantum computer company uh, worth 1.2 billion doing a SPAC. And so a company worth 1.2 billion and the quantum computer is still in research, right? <laughs> so yeah. it, it hasn't really made it into production. Their pre-revenue at 1.2 billion mm-hmm. uh, uh, from an from a IPO standpoint. Uh, and, and then uh, there's another quantum computer that's uh, worth three, m- more than three billion, and uh, you know they they've been pretty stealth about you know what they have. Uh, so so figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. And what area out of all of the verticals that you mentioned is the most exciting to you? Is it the sensors? Is it more of the picks and picks and shovels? I guess is there is there one subset that you think is going to provide? Bigger opportunities and outsized returns. Yeah, I, so so I, I think the, the 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 areas I like are basically the uh, uh, what I call transitional tech or bridge tech, uh, Joel. Because uh, in order for us to get to towards the realization of quantum, we, we need to make sure that we can bridge whatever we have now with that kind of technology, right? So yeah. it's not all of a sudden you know you sleep today, the following day you wake up and say, oh, quantum computers here, quantum nirvana is here. It, it doesn't happen that way. No, normally it's like a, a lengthy transition from an industry standpoint. Uh, so what you want to do is like, uh, who are the company that can actually, you know, transit not only bridge and transition you towards classical and uh, and quantum, uh, but can not only walk you through that, but also become a pure quantum company as that journey comes about, right? So I think those kind of companies that are able to do that transitional bridging aspect of things, uh, as uh, you know, as they grow their their uh, their startup, I, I think those would be good winners. How many years till you think quantum will be mainstream? How many years do you think they will be personal computers and what will they look like? Oh, wow. So, you know, believe it or not, I did talk to one startup that's already thinking about doing a quantum desktop. <laughs> yeah. So, but will it be a desktop or will it be it, implanted it could, in, will it be implanted in Neuralink where you can kind of tap the Neuralink and see a screen? I guess, you know, where, where do you think it could head that could it, be it, maybe it, out of this world? Yeah, it will be all of that, right? So yeah. th- there's there's definitely a lot of work uh, happening with uh, putting everything down to quantum chip level. So sim- mm-hmm. similar to like an AI chip, right? Uh, it, there's there's a lot of work there, it's similar to you know the sensors that we have now, right? So it's it's going to come to that. Uh, it's going to get embedded. So it's, you know we're going to even become more cyborg uh, than 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 we want. Um, yeah. So it, it's really all of that, Joel. It, it's it's going to come to. It, it's just a matter of you know, uh, now you have technology that's more exponential. What can it do to you? What can yeah. it do for us? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, Farouk, it looks like you had a question. Yeah, I mean, I'm really learning a lot here. Um, and I was sort of thinking, hey, I, I had seen AWS market a quantum computing service. Yeah. And then I just Googled this and, you know, this is a copy paste uh, yeah. one liner from their platform. So what's the story here? Like, because they talk about, I was sort of reading it more in depth here. So they talk about simulation for different types of quantum computers. So do they actually have something or this is sort of, you know, some sort of a simulation test to test no, out? So- yeah, good, good question there. So, um, so Amazon Bracket, what they do is they partner with a different quantum hardware, right? So they offer that as quantum computing as a service, and so, so there are there are things that you can run uh, within the quantum computer itself if you're able to do quantum uh, programming and stuff like that, right? So you're you're, you're able to do that, uh, but there's also things that you could do you or what we call quantum inspired applications. So basically, these are quantum algorithms that you run in in a classical computing simulation software. <laughs> okay, so uh, so that is what we call quantum inspired because the you know, algorithm itself is quantum, right? Quantum algorithm. The mode it, in which it runs, it runs in a classical computer, a high performance classical computer. Uh, inside of a simulation software, uh, although it's not as fast compared to you know what a typical uh, what a quantum computer would do, uh, uh, it still works, right? So that's a quantum inspired. So it's a good way for us to you know a good way for uh, companies to test out quantum without necessarily having quantum hardware. 
So that that's uh, that, that's another uh, approach. So you know, if if I give you you know a comparison for classical versus quantum in terms of these applications, so think of uh, let's say uh, Amazon, right? So Amazon, uh, they have a a store, e e-commerce store. Uh, so let's say you have a matrix of 100 million products versus 100 million users, right? So in that matrix, uh, and you do a recommendation engine, if it runs on a classical computer, uh, it will take 1 trillion steps to get a recommendation. If it runs in a quantum computer, it'll take 1,000 steps. So if you look at that, the, the disparity between the number of steps versus, you know, on classical versus quantum, uh, it's definitely a huge gap, right? So, and we're just talking about nascent technology. So this is a test that's been done by uh, one of the um, uh, one of the quantum development platform companies out there. So look, look at the power of that kind of, uh, the scale of that kind of power. Yeah, that's yeah, really helpful. Um, any other questions, guys? We've got around like seven minutes. Um, I'll sort of start getting towards the conclusion. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll ask about, is there a, uh, or have you seen, or maybe you have put together something like a market map or sector map or a white paper on this sort of, you know, beyond just the very basic one-on-one, like slightly deeper level uh, where we sort of, we could read it and understand it and figure out, okay, what's sort of happening beyond the surface. Oh, there's there's definitely a lot of really good reports coming out from uh, McKinsey and uh, mm -hmm. and BCG. Uh, I'd be happy to share that with you guys if you guys are interested. Uh, BCG has a great report. McKinsey just came out uh, with a new report uh, in December, and tells you definitely you know all the quantum landscape, what kind of use mm -hmm. cases, uh, what are all the different uh, components of the quantum. Uh, the, the, the quantum industry, right? So anywhere from components to software to hardware to things like that that you're looking for. Uh, so you can see, you know, the, the, the entire view. Awesome, thank you very much. Sure. So, you know, we'll open it up for questions, but one thing I always ask Nardo is uh, a piece of life advice that maybe a mentor or a family friend gave you that you'd like to share with us. Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, if you're surrounded with uh, really exponential technology, you, you have to make sure you surround yourself with people that think about the good that technology can do, right? So, because, you know, typically we get lost in the shiny object type scenario. So I, what, what I tend to do is I want to make sure that when, when I work this world and when I work the uh, exponential side of, uh, of technology, uh, I need to make sure that I surround myself with people that are, uh, you know, all about humanity, all about good, all about ethics, all about, you know, make sure that it's morality as well and things like that uh, to ensure that when I'm making a bet, it's not just about a bet towards the technology, it's a bet towards, you know, humanity winning. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, what would you recommend for people who want to start their own fund? What are maybe the, the top three steps that they should do? Uh, I, I would say that that inventory of what they have, that, that mm -hmm. would be a, a good step. Second, definitely join a group, right? Sutton Capital yeah. is, a, is a great one. VC Labs is a great one. Uh, definitely join that. And, and then mm -hmm. you have to find your tribe, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, when I, when I joined uh, VC Labs, you know, one of my cohort members pretty, pretty much said, Nardo, you have to join Sutton too. So I joined <laughs> Sutton's, uh, Sutton's uh, Slack channel. All of a sudden, yeah. you know, oh my gosh, here's an extension of the uh, a bigger tribe here. So th that's what you need to do because yeah. um, uh, uh, there, there's a lot to learn. And, mm -hmm. and I think that the other one is just be coachable, listen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and don't let your ego get in the way. <laughs> and it's a small ecosystem. So, you know, one of the cohorts that I'm gonna be launching soon it's uh, it's funny because you know everyone everyone knows everybody and everybody's been to all the same programs, right? So people like when I'm you know messaging people in Slack, they're like, "Oh my god, it's great to see uh, these five people because they're all my friends," you know. So it's it's really, I think, friendships first, and um, and it is a small ecosystem. So I, I guess in my experience, just try to be nice to everybody and, and be generous, and I think it comes together. But yeah, it's too small of a industry um to to not be able to build relationships with everybody so i think 
And I think you can also uh, get feedback on your thesis. So I think one thing that I've also seen yeah. is uh, peer reviewing. So a lot of times if you're, if you're thinking about something, it's very similar to software, right? So you want to start a fund. This is minimum, you know, they, I've heard the term minimum viable fund, right? You have, you're thinking of this concept of a, uh, you know, $10 million healthcare fund, a digital health uh, fund, you know, bounce that off of five or six people and get feedback, maybe even non-VCs mm -hmm. um, and see what they say. And I think just, and then from there you get a bunch of feedback and then you, and then you iterate off of that. So it's, um, so it's definitely an iterative process. And then I would say, um, I think the other value of being part of a community is everybody's sharing notes and thoughts on the different yeah. vendors and the tools and the platforms and the lawyers. Um, yeah. So that collective uh, thought sharing, uh, knowledge sharing is really helpful too. That's what I would say. You know, one of the things I have is, uh, you know, create, create, so, you know, when, when you start working, you know, with other funds and stuff, mm -hmm. create a support group. Right, so I have a weekly yeah. support group uh, of all different types of VCs because mm -hmm. all of us are, you know, in different stages, right? And yeah. what you do is you you want to kind of learn from each other and share and and all of that stuff uh, and and see how you can help out and uh, and, and don't be and don't be shy in sharing. You, you share what you know, share what you have, search, share what you found out. Uh, that that's the only way you grow. And uh, the more you do that, the more it comes back to you. Yeah. No, that's, that's really helpful advice. Um, I'll just really give one more opening here. If anybody else wants to ask any questions, feel free to, uh, to shout it out. Any final questions, guys? Okay. All right. Well, Nardo, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming out. And um, it was uh, really great learning uh, going deep on quantum. Uh, so thanks for sharing all the, uh, the, uh, the thought leadership around that. Okay, thanks, Joe. Thanks for All having right. me.